Hey, everybody, we have an amazing episode for you today. Sequoia Capital is the greatest venture capital firm of all time. It's indisputable. And today we have the leader who has shepherded the firm for four decades, from the 90s to the 2000s, 2010s, and now into the 2020s. It's an incredible episode. It'll be a top five episode of all time for this week in startups, I predict. And uh, without further ado, Doug Leone from Sequoia. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Squarespace. Turn your idea into a new website. Go to squarespace.com slash twist for a free trial. When you're ready to launch, use offer code twist to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. First Republic Bank, where everybody gets a personal banker who's reachable by phone, email, or text and through First Republic's banking app. Learn more at firstrepublic.com slash startup. Member FDIC, equal housing lender. And Linode. Linode's startup program is built specifically for founder-led early stage startups. It's called Rise, and it comes with a three-year discount program and tech consultants to help with infrastructure growth. Apply today at linode.com slash twist. Hey, everybody, welcome to This Week in Startups. Really excited to have our next guest on. Doug Leone is the global managing partner of Sequoia Capital, and he's been at Sequoia since 1988. When I graduated high school, I got to meet him as an entrepreneur uh, and be a scout for Sequoia when they started their scouts program. And he has been, uh, well, just an amazing force in venture capital, especially on international expansion uh, and supporting some of the greatest founders uh, in the history of capitalism, uh, full stop. You guys know all the companies that Sequoia has backed, and we've got a great hour with Doug today to talk about what he's learned about entrepreneurship, venture capital. Welcome to the program, Doug. Thank you, and thank you for reminding me that you were graduating high school when (laughs) I joined Sequoia Capital. It's a nice start to a podcast. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, things have changed dramatically, I think, over... Uh, the past couple of decades, it seems like the last decade has been particularly, uh, particularly has changed. What was venture capital like in 1988 when you joined? And, and what drove you to join Sequoia? Uh, back in the 70s, even before I joined and in the 80s, we were building the infrastructure of what is now called the internet. We were building semiconductors, we we're building systems, we we're building networking. So it was truly a technology investment business. And in those days, you were not backing 22-year-olds. If you're building a chip, you really don't want to back someone who's never built a chip. What you want to back is a Cisco engineering manager who's built four chips. So the founders were a little older. The R&D cycles were a little longer. There was really no need for seed investing. What can you do with a seed investment if it takes you 15 months to build a chip? So there were no seed investors. The founders were a little older. And if something wasn't working out with a founder, co-founder, you could not repot that founder, co-founder like you can now. A CEO can become at a product. A CEO can become chairman and move back to CEO in the case of Larry Page. In those days, you couldn't have that. Uh, and so it was much more to the point. The words used were quite different. Uh, it, you know, it was two by fours to soften somebody. Uh, it was no diversity conversation. Uh, it was really more hardcore. It just reflected the general business in overall the other parts of America. And that was the case until, in my mind, until Netscape went public in, I believe, 1995, where we became interconnected and connectivity allowed for new business models that only continued through the iPhone. Mm. And new business models led to creative ideas, which led to younger founders, which led to low-cost computing, which led to weekend prototypes, which led to seed investments, and which led to the generation of founders that we see now uh, that tend to skew a bit younger. Uh, And the market caps we saw in consumer investing that we never saw in technology investing. So Mm. the exits got way bigger. The all-American economy, they discovered technology. Everybody came in. Uh, Prices didn't matter. Everybody made the calculus that if you pick them right, it doesn't matter what price you pay. Bad habits in running business. And you saw the evolution where we are right now, or maybe where we were 
three months ago until this market adjustment, which was the great race to zero returns. And that poses a whole new set of challenges. But that whole evolution happened since I joined the, the business in 1988. Amazing change over 30 years. And, and here we are where people think valuations don't matter. Entry price doesn't matter. Governance doesn't matter. These things uh, seem to be alarm bells for anybody who's been doing this for, you know, even a couple of years. Or, but I've been doing it from a decade when you guys gave me my start as uh, one of the first Sequoia Scouts. Thank you for that. And we'll get into the Scouts program. So when we look at today's market and you see uh, folks raising party rounds, no governance, raising you know ten million dollars on a fifty million dollar valuation without a prototype or a deck even uh, maybe they've just written a, a memo about what they're going to do how much does this concern you the thing that really concerns me from the founder standpoint then i'll show concerns from the venture standpoint but the founders are, are truly the head of the dog from the founder step standpoint is you start building these habits words like doesn't matter you know the trap words. Uh, founder friendly. You want to talk about founder friendly, the ultimate trap word. It's like when you meet someone, they call you buddy. Uh, that's what founder yeah. friendly says. I like to say we're founder focused. We'll become friends over time, but we're founder sure. focused. That concerns me because bad habits start being built. And I've never been involved with any startups that has had a rocket launch with no bumps. And unfortunately, these bad habits really come home to roost when you have a little bump. Suddenly, cash matters, habits matters, the type of people you hire matter. All the things that didn't matter suddenly matter. So it concerns me a whole bunch from the founders. And to me, the vignette in my mind is the founder who does a whole bunch of safes, i.e. free money. And one day, they finally find their spouse, i.e. the venture investor with whom now they're going to spend the next 10 years. They do a quick calculus. Maybe the venture investor wants to own 15%, 20%, not egregious, not 40 or 50. And all these safes calculate into the founder having lost 54% of his or her company after the Series A completely breaks my heart. And so it concerns me a ton from the entrepreneur side. It also concerns me from the investor side because, quite frankly, the best relationships are win win. Founders have to win, investors have to win. And if the investor gets squeezed to 9%, 8%, 7%, what you're going to find is the great people that want to bring it, bring it, bring the value, bring the work, and so on. They look undifferentiated to the founders. The ownership is undifferentiated, and, and the, the business models are destroyed. And you know, Jason, that a company, when they start, they don't have a lot. A little brand help from Sequoia, a little credibility, if only that can help to recruit. And the, the founder loses that, and, and it's just us, us. There's many great firms. There's, there's, I shouldn't say many. There's a handful. Then the uphill climb is, is even worse. And so I think it turns a win-win into a lose-lose. So actually, it, it, it concerns me quite a bit. Yeah, it does seem that this trend of not having governance uh, and doing these party rounds and nobody leading means nobody has skin in the game. And I think what you know my relationship with sequoia and what i saw up close and personal is when sequoia makes an investment they're all in they're at every board meeting they're there early they've read the materials and, and they're going to work really hard and then the rest of the world and the ecosystem knows that so right after you raise money from sequoia your email starts going off with every other series b firm that wants to take the meeting that wants to get to know you maybe do a preemptive financing w what does world-class governance look like for a founder in a series a company and a series b company and what is the role of that board? Because it, it does seem like we had some weird thing happen where we empowered a bunch of founders and we can think about a lot of examples, whether it's WeWork or others, where the founders had a lot of power, the governance was very weak, and things went off the rails. So what does good governance look like in your well, experience? It's, it's not a uniform answer. I can argue both sides. There's the WeWork side where it didn't work to have founder control. Conversely, yeah. Mark Zuckerberg almost lost his company because uh, the, the investors wanted to sell it. So mm -hmm. a lot of it is a case by case. I'm in business at New Bank with David Velez. I insisted that he had control of the board because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, a lot of these boards are made up of people. Yes, there's a couple of venture folks, but then there's a whole bunch of people who own three shares. And so mm -hmm. who do I trust more? An accomplished founder? 
or a board that's not vested in. So my answer to you, Jason, as, as much as you might have expected, I was going to say good governance is a balanced board, system of yeah. checks and balances. I think it's case by case. To me, where it gets really scary is where you have the decent young founder that sees everybody have board control. I want board control. Or maybe mm-hmm. you've got four founders. They all want to be on the board. You know, I've got little tricks. If you got four founders, I'm in, but I've got the dividing vote because if it's two mm-hmm. against one, we can fix it. Yeah. If it's two right. against two, we got gridlock. So I was on a board of a company with four founders on the board. I said, I'm good with that. One condition. Yeah. If two yeah. argue against two, then I come in. And so there's these little things you do to make sure the company can survive and excel and endure these predictable founder issues that may arise when you've got too many chickens in the coop yeah. Uh, yeah. and so on. But yeah. there is no one answer. Listen, Squarespace is the platform where you can build or sell anything. You know Squarespace, it's the best. We love it here at launch and we've used them for a bunch of our different projects. Anytime we got a new project, boom, we just launch a Squarespace site. And here are three awesome Squarespace features that founders are gonna love. Number one, e-commerce. Obviously, Squarespace has all the tools you need to get your business off the ground, including beautiful templates, inventory management APIs, advanced analytics, and a super simple checkout process. Number two, mobile optimization. All your websites are optimized for mobile right out of the box. So not only does it look great on the desktop, it also looks great on tablets of any size and mobile phones of all different variants. And Number three, Squarespace now has member areas. This is a great new feature. If you want to generate revenue through exclusive members-only content, well, Squarespace is the place to do it. So you can sell a subscription to cooking classes and recipes. Maybe you got piano tutorials. The possibilities are endless. And this can all be done on Squarespace's easy-to-use platform with incredibly reasonable, some people might say, too reasonable pricing. So here's what I want you to do. Head to squarespace.com slash twist for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code TWIST to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Just build it on squarespace.com slash twist. That, that, that absolutely makes sense. Let's talk about the impact selling secondary shares has had on founders. I think there was this perception this would be the end of the industry. A lot of people came out against it. Hey, founders shouldn't be able to sell until the IPO or the exit. But then we saw something strange happen. And I think you guys had uh, obviously the closest view of this. YouTube had to sell early, obviously, they had a huge lawsuit. Um, and then Instagram decided to sell early, arguably, those two businesses would be quarter trillion dollar $500 billion businesses, I think we would both agree. But they sold early. That's right. In one case, maybe it was the legal in the other case, uh, maybe the founder just, um, you know, made a mistake. I don't know. How do you look at keeping founders in the game? and keeping them long term greedy as opposed to short term and the impact that secondaries has had on the industry. The thing I find really offensive is when a series B firm in a series B round prior to maybe even the product is shipped offers what I call a bribe. It is it truly is a bribe. I don't care what name you put on it to a founder that says, "Hey, sell some shares, we'll increase the pool, we'll re up you." Uh, forget about those Series A. It is really a bribe, and it's meant to divide the founders from the Series A investors, which creates, I'm going to use a bit of a technical term, a bit of a show at that point, because because it's a mess. That's one case where I am incredibly opposed. But if you've got a founder who's done something, who's reached some scale, uh, from my standpoint, uh, why not have the founder take 5% of their ownership? Maybe that founder has a wife and children. Maybe, you know, look, we're in Silicon Valley. Th- things are expensive. Not cheap to live here. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe you want to buy a house. And that also uh, prevents the founder from doing something silly and wanting to sell the company simply because $100 million sounds like a whole pile of money. I, I was on the board of a company where the founders wanted to sell the company for $75 million. The founder... Uh, had a new baby, a new wife, it was going to make $20 million. And so we allowed a small secondary, I blocked the sale, founder wasn't very happy until the company was sold for $4 billion. And now he's my best friend. And so, you, you know, those things happen. Sometimes we get accused of, quote, playing the portfolio, but that's not the case. Because first of all, we have the power law, as you know, it's only a couple of companies that generate most of the returns. 
Well, what we do have is pattern recognition when it starts working, where we can spot this company's working, Mr. Founder, don't sell it. In which case, boy, 10% secondary is great. Now, at that point, I don't just want to allow the founder to sell. I find it very unfair for the founder to sell. A founder is a founder until he's unemployed, and then he should be treated like everybody else. And then I insist on a vertical slice of the company. I think everybody should be treated fairly. Also, a founder, he needs to signal to the employees that he's a leader of men and women. How do you become a leader when you have preferential treatment? It's like the general who eats caviar while everybody else is on the front lines. You know, a quote that probably can hit home right now in light of what's going on in the Ukraine. Yeah. And so yeah. I think people should be treated equally. I think the founders should be no different than a receptionist. In fact, the founder's job is to make the receptionist rich. If the founder makes the receptionist rich, I guarantee you everybody wins. And this is, I think, something people have a misconception about in Silicon Valley, they say, well, why does this person deserve this money? Why did the person who painted the mural at Facebook or the Google chef make all this money? That's why we have the level of enthusiasm for these companies. And the work ethic we have is that everybody gets to partake. And, and what you're saying here is with these secondary offerings, we've seen situations where the founder says, you know what? Okay, there's $20 million to be had. My co founder and I get to get 10 each, we're done. Whereas, hey, maybe there's early employees who could you know, that $100,000 or $250,000 could pay down some lo student loans, or maybe put a down payment on an apartment or something, it should be fair. And this, I've started to see this now as a seed investor, in many companies where the series B comes in and the founder goes, this person's offering to give me 20% more shares and re up me and take $4 million in secondary, everybody's going to get diluted, not the 20% of the round, but it's going to be 37%. And that's the only deal I could find. They're like, wait a second, but we're talking to 20 VCs. W did any of the other ones get to term sheet level? And it is exactly a bribe. These two things should be separated. Wouldn't that be a much better practice that the, um, the CEO getting re-upped or the secondary was done after the investment at a board meeting with proper diligence and a proper process? Look, we, we have had a number of firms and they're usually the momentum firms they're, they're the firms mm. that show up during go-go days and they run mm. away the moment there's hiccups trying that and we make it very clear if you pull that off we will try to shut you out of all investments it's not because we're greedy because i think it damages companies it damages relationships and we believe in a very long term we want to you know now with the sequoia capital fund that you know about we can tell a founder, we want to be your business partner if you execute for 25 years. There's no reason why we can't be. And that relationship is built brick by brick. And while it takes a long time to create, it takes very little to break it. And a violation of trust is the very way that gets broken either way, either way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is a long term game uh, that we're playing here. And that's, th that's what makes the ecosystem work. It works on trust and, and you have to trust that everybody is incented in using that capital structure uh, properly. Let's talk a little bit about this new structure you're doing where Sequoia's LPs will then be part of this new fund, the Sequoia fund, where you don't have to liquidate some of these great investments because my understanding is all these great investments Sequoia made over the years, many of them did better after the IPOs than they did even in the private market, which I thought was just mind boggling when you think about it. But company like Google, company like Apple, if you hold those shares for a long time, my lord, there's no reason to ever sell a company like that. And if you knew in the private markets, this was a great company. Well, then you know, in the public markets, don't you? Well, look, it, it's way tougher to go from zero to 5 billion in market cap than to go from five to 20 billion. We've learned that lesson slowly over the years. I mean, mm. we uh, distributed Cisco system I think I've less than five hundred million dollar market cap, and you know what did what did that thing end up to be worth? We were a lot more careful with, with Yahoo and Google and ServiceNow and Facebook, but we could be doing a lot, a lot better. So we have a long list of these companies, and so we looked at our public holdings one day, our public and private holding, and they were almost eighty billion dollars. And instinctively, we said we have a competitive advantage. How do we punch to our weight, not below our weight? Mm -hmm. What can we do with this asset in a win-win? What I mean by win-win, well, win-win-win. Founders first, limited partners, in our case, 70% are nonprofits, and Sequoia. And we thought, boy, if we could telegraph to founders 
that we can be with you for a very long time. That's a win for the founders. If we can tell limited partners, we'll help you manage your distribution so you don't sell the day you get them, hold them for the long term. And from our standpoint, if we could be on these boards, a handful of boards for a long time, that really helps us as well. So we thought we had a unique asset that not everybody can replicate because, you know, if we say we generated seven trillion in market cap, 250 IPOs, it doesn't take much to, to fund for another partner to say we, we kind of did that too. We have a hundred IPOs, but for the Sequoia fund, what you need is a corpus of big exits and a track mm -hmm. record of that. So we think we have a unique advantage that's beneficial to founders, long term capital. It's beneficial to limited partners greater returns, most of them great causes, beneficial to us to gain market power so we can serve founders better, we don't have to flinch as much and so on. So we had this notion that we had an asset and Ruloff really is the one that took, uh, took the lead. You know, he, he was CFO of PayPal and an IQ God knows how high yeah, to figure out cat. how do we take advantage. But we all had the insight that there was an advantage. It's Ruloff that developed it into a product. Listen, in business and in life, long-term relationships are the key to success, and First Republic Bank believes they're also the key to your financial health and well-being. That's why every First Republic client gets their own personal banker to serve as their guide, confidant, and single point of contact. Have you ever had money issues and not been able to reach your bank quickly? I have, and it's absolutely brutal. With First Republic, that'll never be a problem. You can reach your personal banker by phone, email, text, or through First Republic's banking app. Ashley, a managing director on my team, has worked with First Republic on one of our fund accounts for almost four years, and she loves their customer service and support. Again, this is not a one-time transactional situation. It's a true partnership you can count on for years to come. In fact, about 70% of their bankers have been with the bank for over a decade. Discover what a long-term financial relationship can do for you. Visit firstrepublic.com slash startup today to learn more. That's firstrepublic.com slash startup. Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender. And the product, uh, how did that conversation go with these, you know, the greatest LPs in the world? And it's one of the great things when you're a Sequoia founder and you, you get to come to a Sequoia dinner and see, wow, we're working really hard. Hey, Sequoia, you know, you know, 10x, 20x, 50x, the Ford Foundation or whatever fund it is that's doing incredible work in the world. How did they take this uh, concept of, hey, let's hold the public companies for a long time and let us help you manage that because, hey, we found the companies when it was two people. We kind of know what we're doing here. Uh, did any of them say, I, I don't want to participate? Did all of them say, sure, we so trust prior you? prior to answer your question, I want to make yeah. sure the audience knows how seriously we take our role. On one side, we have mostly nonprofits whether it's women's rights or African-American rights or underprivileged kids like me that couldn't have gone to college, that is really, or what's going on in the Ukraine, there's a lot of capital for these foundations heading over there. On the other side, we have these founders who can see the future and want to build great companies. And little old Sequoia is in the middle of this. Well, how privileged is that role? And we take Incredible. that extremely seriously. Now, when we asked LPs how much they would convert, they had public holdings. You have a choice, Mr. LP or Ms. LP. You can either get the distribution or let us manage. I'm happy to say that 95 cents out of every eligible dollar decided to let us manage it. Furthermore, we received over $8 billion in extra cash. By the way, take some more cash too, the ah. Sequoia Capital. And furthermore, there was a lot of capital from us the general partners, the investors Sequoia, that rolled over complete alignment with the LPs. And so they saw us rolling over. They gave us an incredible commitment and they added cash to us because they, they completely bought into a strategy that long-term hold is quite beneficial to them. And who else is best equipped to know when these companies, uh, how long these companies can grow than us who are actually sitting on those boards. And so our goal is, can we beat NASDAQ by a few percentage points, five percentage points, once, this, once the security is public, and we have a long track record of showing that for the ones we deem long-term franchise company, and we can seem to pick them, they can beat mm -hmm. NASDAQ by, by quite a large amount. It doesn't mean every company. It doesn't mean every company, but it does mean a number of them that we've been investors with. Um. 
you have built a reputation of acting at a high level and working incredibly hard, even in the cases where and it's still the majority of companies, even for Sequoia, the companies don't work out or fail uh, outright, or they just return one x or five x, which doesn't move the needle when you have other things in the portfolio. How do you mentor and train this next generation of investors? I watched firsthand as Alfred and Ruloff joined the firm. And now there's a whole another generation I'm meeting at, at, at Sequoia. Uh, how do you train them of how to behave and how to be supportive, even when you know, hey, this company is not going to be the one that makes the fund? First, it all starts with the type of people that you pick. And the type of people that we pick, I, I, I'd like to say they were not the quarterback of the football team in high school. They were the loners, <laughs> shunned to the side a bit, too much IQ, a little quirky, and so on. And they have a chip on their shoulders. They are pissed off. They'll always mm -hmm. going to be pissed off. But within that, they have to be good souls. And so when we look for people who have taken, who are a little pissed off in life for whatever reason, mom reason, dad reason, brother reason, uh, you know, life reason, no means reasons, uh, mm. who are driven like crazy, sometimes because of injury, emotional mm. injury, that are good souls when you peel the onions, and we mm. put them in an environment of trust, both compensation trust, we're relatively flat, decision-making trust, give credit trust. Uh, give attractive deal source. Doug Leone didn't do service now. Pat Grady's the one who sourced it. Alfred Lynn, he joined us right away. He got Airbnb. When most firms will give you the crappy deal, we'll give you the wonderful investment uh, mm -hmm. or the wonderful company. Mike Moritz is on Google. Well, I source Google, but the fact we have this we approach, point one. Mm -hmm. Point two, a little dirty secret. Most investors make the calculus, you know, if a company's not working, why do I want to jump in and try to fix and maybe piss off the entrepreneur later? I'm going to get the negative reference. Why don't I just put a big smile on my face? Not all the way until failure, but that, you know, I'm now founder friendly. Well, yeah. let me make sure, you know, we don't have a bone in our body that can do that. Okay. Hmm. I could be on two boards, a company struggling that we're trying to keep alive and the company where we make $2 billion. I may call the $2 billion company first, but right away afterwards, not the day after, a minute later, I'll call the other person. Meaning that uh, for those of you that have children, you have children of different capabilities. There's no way you're going to not help the one who's struggling. And mm. it's just who we are. We just can't help it. You know, we're right. going to work as hard as we can to help that company because at least in my mind, I think. There are people that have risked their careers, that are husband, that have wives and children at home, that are wives who are husband and children at home. How, if you if you're, have any sense of humanity, how can you not jump in and help that company until the very end? And one thing I tell founders, don't just do references on Sequoia or on me or what work. Of course, those are going to tell you what an incredible board member I am. Go ask yeah. the last two companies that haven't worked and ask them about behavior. Ask about how generous we were when we did a, a carve out for employees. D did we nickel and dime you or were we as generous as we possibly could? Those are the real references that count in the same way that you learn more in failure than you do when things are nice and rosy. Another uh, thing that has changed the industry was Sequoia's um, inside rounds for WhatsApp. You, from what I understand, there were two or three rounds of investing, you saw this was a rocket ship. And you said, Hey, if you need more money, we'd be willing to uh, invest in the company. And I think Sequoia did that three or four times talk about crucible moments. And then when the company sold, obviously it was the greatest exit, I think up until that point in the history of Silicon Valley when it sold to Facebook for 20 billion, I believe if my memory is serving me correctly. Uh, and you were the only investors, <laughs> essentially in the company. Tell me about making that decision to pioneer that new technique of the inside round? Well, I don't think it was new. Uh, I, mm. I, we've done that a whole bunch of other times where if a company's mm. working, we vertically integrate it. We were a venture firm. We did a growth business. We did a seed business. We did a pre-IPO called Global Growth Fund. Essentially, we've learned that when a company's working and they need more capital, and, and we've been working with that company for six, seven years, why shouldn't we continue to invest? Mm. Sometimes it's an inside round. Sometimes it's a later stage round along with other people. But the notion is we have a nice uh, stable of companies we, like Stripe, C, Venture Growth, or Nubank, 
party mm -hmm. one, seed, venture, growth. Why not continue to invest? And sometimes you're the only investor because you're the devil they know. And I hate to use yeah. those terms. Yeah. The other side of, of, of the argument, and it's a good argument, a founder may say, hey, I don't want control in the hands of one firm, or I want mm -hmm. a secondary Rolodex. I remember in DoorDash, we wanted to do the Series B, and the seal rightfully said, I've got your Rolodex, let me go get a second Rolodex. So each mm -hmm. situation is, is, is different. What we'd like to do, though, is be able to double down and triple down, including at the IPO. We have a hedge fund. We actually have a couple of hedge funds to buy shares. And we have a number of IPO shares that we bought and never sold a share. I'm talking we bought five, six years ago. So we truly have the ability to go from idea to IPO and beyond. And why not ride those incredible winners for a very, very long time? And to me, that means 20, 25 years. Cloud infrastructure costs are one of the biggest expenses for startups. I see it. And they're also some of the most unpredictable. It's no wonder that many startups get lured to the major cloud providers with the promise of free credits only to wind up locked into unpredictable cloud bills and outrageous costs. I see this all the time. Some startup, we're looking at the P&Ls, boom, 5K, 20K spikes. What's going on here? Oh, our cloud costs. We found out after. Well, Linode is here to change the cloud journey for startups. How? Well, they provide predictable pricing and have industry-leading pricing performance ratios. It's really simplified infrastructure and, of course, 24-7, 365 day a year award-winning support. So, Linode has a startup program. It's called Rise. And it's built specifically for founder-led early-stage startups. They're offering a three-year discount program and technology consultants to help guide you in your infrastructure journey. So apply to the RISE program today at linode.com slash twist, L-I-N-O-D-E dot com slash twist. Okay, so now we're looking at a 2025-year arc for Sequoia. And it's interesting you bring up DoorDash. People don't know this perhaps not fully public information. Uh, they were, uh, I, t I spoke to the founders, uh, and there was a large late stage, let's call it Johnny come lately firm that was splashing cash around market was hot. They dragged them on for a year, couldn't get the deal closed. Uh, and the company DoorDash was uh, facing the risk of ruin. You guys came in and saved the day with a pretty large round and a pretty risky bet. Maybe you could tell me a little bit about those crucible moments for you when company is, you know, gets left at the altar by another one of those large late stage firms, and, and you had to come in and, and basically save the company. Well, look, the very best thing about those situations, those founders tend to be razor sharp. There's nothing like mm -hmm. being at the precipice of death to make you <laughs> sharp. We have other cases where the founders have had extremely easy the whole run, and those tend to be uh, more sloppily run company. I won't mention name, but we have those. Sure. So the yeah. great lesson for DoorDash for me, or the great benefit, yes, it was left at the altar. And it wasn't quite as easy. We came in and saved the day because I don't want to take all the credit. We went out and, and got another firm with deep pockets and two of us saved the, the day. I insisted okay. on that. I remember saying, we can't be the only one. We may not have enough cash to save the day by ourselves. Right. But we organized the round. Two of us held hands and saved the, the day. But we wanted to save the day. It, it was a great business with a great founder. And boy, to me, the greatest takeaway of DoorDash is that founder learned any lesson he wanted to learn. And to this day, DoorDash is one of the best run company in Silicon Valley. It's a tough business with Tony running a terrific operation. And one of the reasons is he went through very tough times. Yeah, it's, uh, people sometimes think it's like, you know, these incredible founders make these incredible companies. Sometimes it's these incredible companies and the journey and those near death experiences that actually make the founders. It makes you. That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about that. Well, greatest founders you've worked with, uh, the founders who you watched up close and personal evolve uh, and, and really be what people thought, I think, in the early days of Silicon Valley was impossible. We thought, hey, Larry and Sergey could do this, but mm, if you're going to go public, you need Eric Schmidt and then. Hey, maybe Larry comes back and Sergey comes back. So who are the founders you've seen do both stages? That ideation, building the original team, getting to 10 people, getting the product to market, and then getting to 10 billion in revenue, 100 billion in revenue. Who are those founders who cross that chasm? So two founders for different reasons. Okay. The first is David Velez of Newbank. One employee was an associate at Sequoia 
And I'll give you two great examples of his early greatness. His CTO was an associate of Francisco Partners. Now you wonder, uh, what's an associate from Francisco Partners doing? A CTO. The mm-hmm. first person in business was a lady, God bless her soul. They got devastating checks at banks in Brazil. And David was smart enough to know the IQ of the person from Francisco was over the top. And the lady from the bank was getting devastating checks because she was a doer. It gave me the insight of his ability to make calls. And suddenly that company exploded and he honestly hasn't made a wrong move. So he transformed himself from founder to leader. And leader means having vision and execution, both, uh, as well as culture. And, you know, the company's running. They just announced a quarter last week, a wonderful quarter. It's I've never seen new product ideation in a business as rapid as his. Uh, It is, uh, you know, for the very long term, I'm very optimistic. I'm not commenting about the very next quarter or anything of the sort. Sure, of course. Uh, The other person, for a very different reason, was Fred Luddy of ServiceNow. And there is a man who started a great business, incredible product market fit, and had the courage to look in a mirror and say, I don't want to run the company. I just like to code. And Mm. then it became an issue of building the trust so he and I can find him as business partners. And to me, there's a lesson there because it all sounds great. You're young. I want to be the leader. I want to be the founder. But sometimes you think you want to be the founder for ego, for all the human traits. And you realize that administrative work, doing reviews, and it's not what you want to do. And Fred, he wasn't a young man. Fred might have been 45, had the courage. Now, we took him to Silicon Valley for a day to meet a whole bunch of executives, VP. At the end of the day, he said, Doug, like we don't have a VP like that in our company. I'm not like any of the CEOs. Can you please help me find a chief of executive offices? I want to run product. And mm. he, he it, it was a bit of a chance he took because he put his trust in me. He had known me for six months or, or in Sequoia. And we found him, Frank Slootman, and the rest is history. Wow. Two yeah. very different cases that bring up two different examples. It's it, Look, it's the idea of knowing and know you don't know. Those are the great things you can live with. What you cannot live with is not knowing what you don't know. That is what trouble yeah. ar- arises. It's that in-between case that causes trouble. Yeah. Slootman's quite an executive. Uh, maybe you could speak a little bit on that guy's ability to execute. I just read his book and had him on the podcast. I mean, he's serious about running a business at a high level. He's three for three. And I'm not talking three for three when the, when the companies were made, made. He's three for three. We had to go in. In a case of the first company, it was extremely young. In a case of service now, we had incredibly upset customers. You know, the company was selling things, but too much, uh, the services. Mm -hmm. In a case of Snowflake, he also had to make some moves. You know, he is the king of no bullshit, extreme focus. We all hold hands. We all agree on what the plan is, and we go execute. And uh, to me, the greatest lesson is, what is the one thing you can focus on? He talks about that. We all want to focus on four things. Everything matters. Frank dares asked yeah. the question, what is the one thing? In fact, I, I was at a board meeting last week uh, at a company. They said, we want to do the six, seven things, all great or ambitious. I finally said, thinking of Frank Slootman, but if you have to get one thing right, what mm. is it? Because I wasn't yes. clear after those seven. And this CEO right. was able to articulate it, which gave me great confidence that he had clarity. Uh, and so in my mind, I've never met an executive more capable than Frank Sloop. It's pretty incredible what he's done. You're, you're absolutely right. Okay, Silicon Valley, uh, we've moved to and, and uh, Don Valentine, I remember saying this, we won't invest in anything we can't bike to uh, rest in peace, Don, a, a juggernaut, and we should talk about him a little bit. And uh, the founding of the firm. Let's talk first about Silicon Valley as the hub of excellence. Uh, everybody was coming here. California was the dream. San Francisco's turned into a bit of a nightmare. California is obviously mismanaged. And then we have the pandemic and everybody goes, you know, uh, in four different directions and companies are all working remote. Seems to be working, uh, but something seems to have been lost. What's your sort of uh, handicapping of what's happened in terms of all of these other centers of excellence, whether it's Austin, Los Angeles, New York, Florida, Miami? Uh, as well as this work from home trend, are great companies going to be made with everybody working at home? Or do people need to be in the headquarters and be at the locus of power and, and be grinding it out? What are your thoughts? 
Lots of questions there. First yeah. of all, uh, on Silicon Valley, I, I think the politicians are doing the best job they can to make sure Silicon Valley does not exist. Uh, cool. And I think the damage done to Silicon Valley is irreparable. Uh, now, wow. that's only part of it. Silicon Valley still have the most companies and so on, but it's nothing like it was uh, five years ago, seven years ago, and it's only going to get worse. But it's not just a fault of politician. The other thing is, we're all interconnected and we're not doing deep technology. You no longer have to be a Stanford PhD candidate. There are many great universities across America. We all communicate. Entrepreneurism has spread throughout the whole globe, not just America, but it's Beijing, Shanghai, Latin America, Europe, and so on. So it's also a bit of that trend. So there are two issues there. So I think it would behoove most partnerships who want to invest to make sure that they don't just have to ride a bicycle to it to quote Don Valentine. Of course, yeah. we made that change. But it was easier for us to initially go to Israel because that looked like Silicon Valley and then China and then India because that looked more like Silicon Valley than go to LA originally and Austin. Right. Now, a few years later, we've gone to Europe. There's a lot of activity, more market leaders. It's not there's opportunity. It's market leaders is what we're interested in because the market leaders has about 70% of the market value. And we're seeing more market leaders throughout the whole globe. So I think that trend is here to continue. So that's the issue in Silicon Valley. What was your second question? You asked me so many oh, questions. So, and people working remotely, yeah. uh, people have seemed to gotten used to this. The concept of coming to Silicon Valley and going up and down Santo Road, doing your eight, nine, 10 meetings, getting two term yeah. sheets. It's now moved to Zooms. 20 minute yeah. zooms, maybe people send you a loom, it's more efficient, people get to meet more companies get to meet more founders, and then the relationships start, I guess, after the investment. Yeah, um, something so, seems to be changed there too. So yeah. one, um, there's a shortage of knowledge workers. So knowledge workers mm -hmm. are the one with the power and knowledge workers have now figured out that if it's for family reasons, in many cases, programmers don't need as much of a social outlet, are perfectly comfortable working in remote locations. In those cases, the companies better have programs to unite people once a quarter, once every six months. But then after that, it's a little bit of game theory. In other words, mm -hmm. if Google offers this, if you want to compete with Google, you have to offer this. I don't think you can tra tra you know, yeah. trailblaze a, a, a new way. I'm a little company in New York City. I'm competing yeah. against Google. And by the way, sh show up at work five days a week. You're just not going to get to people. So I think recognizing the knowledge workers can call their own shots. Uh, you're going to have that. I, ap I actually happen to believe that in salespeople, the closer you move to the outbound part of the company with salespeople being the most outbound, they tend to be more social. They get energy from one another. I think that's mm -hmm. where you want a little more congregation. And so I think we're going to stay hybrid and we have to see where the knowledge workers for the larger companies are going to do first. The trailblazers are going to be Google, they're going to be Apple, they're going to be Facebook, because we compete with those in our little world, and we can't call those shots. We have to essentially follow their leads for the knowledge workers. For the salespeople, I think there's a little more leeway. I think it's sacrilegious to have four salespeople, tell the salespeople, for example, and I know we are leading with, we now have the, the product-led growth and all those good things, but if you've got 10 salespeople, I'd rather have them in one room. I like to see yeah. them now, let them learn to one another, let them get the energy, go out for a beer afterwards and so on. Yeah. And if you look at Facebook and Apple and Google, what do you think the chances they're going to get people to come back to those campuses? Or do you think it's going to be like a two or three day a week I think thing? it's going to be a, a, a two to three day a week. Yeah. You know, it's shocking to say that. Parents and I mean, mothers have gotten used to raising their children. And isn't that a beautiful thing? The yeah, commute of two hours is too painful. And even though I, I'm hearing there's more productivity, I don't believe there's more productivity. I, I try to reach people at home a lot and they don't answer their, their darn cell phone at 3 p.m. <laughs> but you've yeah. got this two hours of commute time that you no longer mm -hmm. have. And so that's time they can spend either working during off hours and doing something with their family. I think it's a good thing for the American society. It's not a great thing for companies who hit a bump because you hit a bump and you need leadership and you need uh some cohesity ah. and some rah 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 moment it's tough to have a rah rah moment with with 50 employees in 50 cities uh and it so does there's a little feel bit of danger like, there yeah that is something i've seen is 
people, especially young people now with this work from home trend, they've never been mentored, they've never been in an office, they're incredibly hard to establish any kind of culture remotely over zoom. And then they get another offer. And it's just like switching a tab in their Chrome browser, they log out of one Slack instance, they're in a new Slack instance, and now they're working that afternoon in a new company. The loyalty and, and the esprit de corps is gone. It's tougher for uh, young people because at the end yeah. of the day, if if you and I work in the same office, you may give a presentation. I may have our opinion of you. But I also mm. build my opinion from the 20 water cooler conversations I have. Are you yes. a good guy? Uh, how do you thinking about other things? That mm. is what essentially is gone. Now I get to snip it from this work interaction we get. And all these other data points of what I think you are as a human being that may make you a great leader. Mm. I may be missing those subtleties. So I actually feel bad for younger people. They're the ones that are suffering th the most from this, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about these uh, venture capital firms? I won't name any specifically, but venture capital firms that now are saying, hey, we're going to build up a bunch of services. I remember Sequoia had one partner who would help with placing uh, great talent, high level talent. But now I'm seeing venture firms doing the marketing for their startups and the HR and you know, and all these different features. Do you think that that is a great model? Or do you think maybe it's a little overblown? Because it seems to me the great founders I've invested in, they don't want you coming there and doing their marketing or, you know, doing their HR, maybe if you got a good reference or two for, for a senior executive, of course, but what are your thoughts on this like higher level of service from firms uh, that is being so pitched? I've seen no models and I'll tell you how we do things. We okay. believe you want to teach a person to fish, meaning if you are a founder, we will help you recruit the first four or five world class engineers because that better be a plus. But mm. recruiting, for example, is a core competency. And if right. we recruit the first 30, you're never going to learn the core competency. And so I think in a world where things are moving faster and faster, because we're interconnected, we're moving faster and faster. You have to run, you know, like once upon a time, you'd go into Europe once you conquer the US. Now you can't do that. You have to run faster. Maybe you have to build two modules at once. And so providing these companies with a running start, a faster running start is a good thing. So I am for services. But what I'm not for is overwhelming services that are a pain in the rear end. I've had more than one CEO say, these guys won't leave me alone. You know, they made mm. me for introduction I, I, or 40 and I, I never got a customer. You know, that's, that's wrong. And the other thing, uh, doing, if you will, too much where the car competency, where the DNA is not built by the founder or the management team. So I think right. services of a role, but I would limit it to a point. It, it's got to help you get a running start. And then, and then you've got to do, look, I, I don't want to continue to do my kids homework in college. You know, right. I may help them in second grade on how to, how to think about a problem with third grade. And I'm not saying that a founder is a third grader. We're right. not better than founders. I'm just making the analogy that there are sort of yes. some core competencies. First time founders have build. never, a yeah. first time founder may have never dealt with an HR exactly. issue. They may have, they don't even, they've never even done recruiting. So we'll talk and you've about seen that it. And, yeah. we'll, and, and, and we'll have, Five conversations will help you recruit, will help you set up systems, but then it's on you. Let's go recruit yeah. a VP of HR. Okay. A lot of companies raising a lot of money at very high valuations. We talked about, you know, some of the pitfalls there, but here we are in a retreating market. The multiples have collapsed. We have some companies in our portfolio. I'm sure you have some of them as well that took advantage of these frothy valuations and put a hundred million in the tank, 250 million in the tank. And now all of a sudden compression. The valuation is just not going to be there. It's not going to be 75 times next year's revenue top line. It's going to be 20 times or something. What's the best advice for those companies that built a war chest? And maybe they're two or three years out now from the valuation they closed last year. Yeah. And so we chuckle because all the hedge fund investors, they used to go, 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 go. Overnight, yeah. the switch is flip. Stop, 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 stop. Neither <laughs> was right. Yeah. Essentially, it's a case by case situation. First of all, you look at the op of the operating model where this company is against all its competitors. I'm on some boards that I tell them time to play defense. I'm on a couple of boards that say attack like crazy because your competitors are weak. Recognizing that most likely the next valuation may not be at a high price, but we have enough money in the bank to go do that. I think most companies have enough cash 
that they don't have to face the conundrum of raising money in a down market. The best company ever have been overfunded. They have the luxury of waiting a couple of years and they should wait. Maybe the market will change and so on. But the thing that's not appropriate for me is the yo-yo, go, 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 stop, 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 because that's just mechanical. It's got to be a company by company analysis of its relevant strength against the competition. That was a lesson we learned in 08 when everybody, we actually told most companies to hold back and we learned the lesson. Maybe if you're strong, don't hold back, continue to invest in R&D, continue to invest in sales and obliterate your competitors who are, who are way more vulnerable, who cannot raise money like you possibly right. can. And so to me, it's case by case a, yeah. and, and a steady hand. Right. And when you have new entrants in the market, these hedge funds who dip down, they're not even taking board seats. A lot of them are just dumping the money in and yeah, let us know when you're going to IPO. It's a very strange phenomenon uh, that seems to have retreated already. Okay, let's take some things outside of uh, maybe what we do on a day to day basis in investing. And let's look at some of the, the, the ecosystem we operate in. And uh, we have a new antitrust uh, a czar in Washington, Lena Khan, and I was just watching an interview with her. And we've now shifted uh, the lens or she wants to shift the lens from not consumer harm, which has been a pretty good lens up until now, if consumers are doing good, the company's probably doing the right thing for everybody. And that's good for society to future competition and maybe rolling back, maybe Instagram or WhatsApp shouldn't have been bought. Um, what do you think of this lens of I'm going to deny acquisitions that could um encumber competition in the future this seems like an impossible test to administer my answer and i chuckle when you ask the questions what do i trust more leave it all alone i mean clearly if there was a well thought out plan to limit misbehavior i would love to see that but i trust the government less to come up with that than just leave it the heck alone and let technology do its thing i'm always mindful that if Zuckerberg didn't buy Instagram, Facebook would probably be gone. So I trust mm. technology to do its thing more right. than I trust regulators to get it right. I hate to sound so harsh, but I actually right. have that as an opinion. Yes, you do have large companies. I won't say any examples. I don't want to embarrass anybody that are misbehaving. Yeah. You know, it happens in the open source, you know, trying to copy the open source solution in, in some companies. Uh, not give access to the underlying platform except for their product first we, we've seen all that but yeah. unfortunately regulators uh, there's always the may, look they mean well sometimes and even when they mean yeah. well there's laws of unintended consequences that seem to do more damage than not and so my view would be less is more let technology do its things and only go after the extreme cases because you have a greater chance of being right picking on those that coming with holistic solutions that retrospectively right. may have done something that you thought they may have done when in fact they wouldn't do that. Let's talk about China. You guys were very early amongst the earliest to set up shop there. Yes. Uh, things changed radically over the last couple of years. Is this still a great place to invest? And what's your thesis on, you know, engagement in China uh, and investing? First, People should know that one, we have a group of partners in China, they make local decisions. And I right. also want people to know that for the last, I want to say 13 years, there's never been a dime extra that anybody in US made from China, meaning that we contribute to a pool, they contribute to a pool, and we all take the money out. So we all have different kinds of nuts and we get a bag of mixed nuts, but it's the same dollar value. So it is not any greed that says we're in China. The reason we went to China, we saw global entrepreneurs even here. And if we have a Chinese founders here uh, and we're competing with NEA, I'm just picking an NEA now, and they have a China yeah. operations that we know, where's the Chinese founders likely to do business with right. us and so on. So that's why we went to China. Some, some defense, some offense. Now, clearly the world is flat. No, it's not flat. We're going to build the parallel technology stacks. And I hope we limit that to the R phase, not the D phase. If I've got a sales product that can figure out what the forecast is based on email traffic, that is not a national secret. Let me be very clear of that. And we yeah. also don't invest in China in companies that specific are aimed at the military. 
it's in no one's interest to do that in any geo. So I just want to lay those ground rules. But the reality are now is that the two countries are in a technological warfare, whether it's AI, whether it's robotics, uh, but that's our, the R phase, not the D phase. We've right. gotten ready for every eventuality, to be perfectly frank. Uh, you know, are we going to be together? We, we've all stated affirmatively we want to stay together. Who knows what the government is going to do? We know every financial services firm of size is operating in China. We're operating in China. Of course, we're the technology leaders. So there, there's a little bit of a spotlight on us. But uh, we've done, I think, everything right for America. We've done, look, and, and I'm an immigrant from Italy. I was given right. an opportunity in this country. I, I love America more than most people you know. Uh, and I would do anything uh, to to protect, um, uh, you know, just to protect our country. We we have done everything right. We have gotten ready for every eventuality. Now, what is going on in China? President Xi, from his perspective, is saying, "I need stability. I've got a billion something people. I can't have forty million people only going to education. Only five million people have access to Tsinghua. I've got to have fifty million people. So everything he's doing is promoting." equity, if you will, mm. one. Two, he doesn't want any company to be overly powerful. So he's told the tech company, stay in your own lane. Don't go into 50 businesses. And by the way, don't become too profitable. No 70% pre-tax operating margin, which means consumer are paying. So that mm. side has some clouds on it. Move over to EV. Move over mm. to robotics. Those are wide open. Move over in, right. in, in, in financial services. Those are wide open. So a lot of it is being on the right side of what the Chinese government is trying to do. Personally, mm. I think it's a fabulous time to invest in China. Why do I say that? Because I inherently want to invest in places where everybody's running away. You know, I don't <laughs> want to invest yeah. when everybody's running in. But you've got to be with a group that understands these trends and invest in the marketplaces that you completely understand are on the right side of what the Chinese government is trying to do. Yeah, and engagement as a strategy is completely logical in terms of two countries trying to build deeper relationships. And we only have control over our side. What the other side decides to do, you know, is, is up to them. Let's talk about Europe. Hasn't been traditionally uh, most countries super favorable to entrepreneurship. You know, we have employment at will here. People try different companies out over there. You know, you want to lay some people off. You have to pay a couple of years severance. Maybe you have to go to court to let them go. But we do see in the Nordic countries, amazingly, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, uh, just incredible companies and, and the unicorns per capita seem to be disproportionate everywhere over uh, over there. What are your thoughts on the European entrepreneurial marketplace? So we looked at Europe, first of all, as an immigrant, I would have loved yeah. nothing more than the Portofino office. You know, oh, I, I joke wonderful. at Sequoia, if you've got a deal in Italy, I've never grabbed that deal in my whole life. A company, if you've got a company in Italy, it's mine. Let's go. I made it very <laughs> clear to everybody at Sequoia. Uh, one. Two, I looked at Europe twice and I saw what you saw. Until we noticed in the last five years, these market leaders called Klarna and Unity and UiPath mm. coming out of Europe. We took note of that. And not to argue, we went to Europe maybe a couple of years too late. Hmm. Um, we have actually, as part of our program, we, while we don't, we, we're not so active in Washington, we decided to be quite active in Europe to educate hmm. these governments. I don't want to do any name dropping, but we've had yeah. fairly high level conversations, including some more coming on what it takes to deploy tech in Europe, whether it's friendly tax laws, don't get taxed at distribution, at sale. Right uh employment laws and i think europe wants to learn because they want to kind of emulate what's happened in the us so not all countries are going to move overnight but they certainly have indicated a willing to be more startup friendly because a lot of countries are realizing in many ways that startups are the lifeblood of the economy it's where the growth comes from so in the major yeah. countries where you'd expect startup activities we have, uh, we have ongoing conversations with senior government officials. I'm talking to the prime minister level uh, yeah. about some of the, 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 these issues. Is the number one thing how they look at employment and the sort of flexibility a startup needs to, to bob and weave and make changes versus 
you know, they're very protectionist, union based, you know, process for changing people's roles in companies. It seems to me a lot of the entrepreneurs I've met, you know, from various countries, they'll move to another region because they need that flexibility. They need to pop up eight people in this office. Oh, that didn't work. Okay, we're going to lay those people off. We'll give them severance. They're going to be fine. They're, gonna, they're tech workers. They'll be fine. Like there'd be 20 jobs for them. Uh, and it was just too much red tape. And it, it, it was hard enough to build a start. Issue. It's how we've done yeah. things for 20 years at a different time oh. when workers weren't being treated nicely. Security for the workers. Go all the way and look at Japan. That's the ultimate of this, right? You don't see a lot of yeah. tech in Japan because some right. of these reasons, a lot of software tech, like, like, yeah. like, what you see is hardware tech. But it's changing. It's changing real That's time. Right. It's going to take another four or five years. Let's talk about participation in the startup market, equity crowdfunding, uh, allowing civilians, you know, non accredited investors to invest in startups. We have syndicates, I run one, one of the larger ones, you have AngelList, uh, and a lot more access, uh, micro funds happening, many people starting these three, 10, $15 million funds, all this activity at the early stage. Um, this is a net benefit to the startup ecosystem. Do you have concerns there? What are your thoughts on just the proliferation of interest in this. And maybe should the United States change accreditation laws to allow more people to participate in startups? Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty unfair that you can go to Las Vegas and lose a million dollars. But God forbid you can invest 50K in, in a startups. I, I think it's lobbyists got that mm -hmm. going. So yes is the answer, point one. Second, I am for anybody investing in startups. But I think a founder should say, here's how much equity X that I want to sell over the life of the company. Hmm. Figure out what a fair split the founder decides. For the first folks who take the enormous amount of risk, but you know after a year or so, they're going to be gone. And somebody's hmm. going to carry the load. They've taken a little less risk for the next seven, eight years. Founders ought to think about that ratio. And mm. say, how much should those people that have taken that enormous risk, but they've had a short tenure with the people mm. that maybe took a hair less risk, but they're now for eight years. And it's where that ratio is out of whack that you've got a real problem, in my opinion. Yeah. People need to be thoughtful when they take, you know, small amounts of money for large amounts of equity, because if it does work, that equity is going to be worth much more and, and you just need to be judicious and then as we you're wrap here for a tenth of a percent to a wonderful engineering candidate when you sold 28 percent for five hundred thousand dollars i find that always yeah. shocking yeah uh luckily you know the thing i've seen now is when we get on cap tables and we see them broken like this we'll say hey listen the cap table is a little broken here do you want to offer the first investors the ability to sell into this round or to recap the company or maybe top off you know the employee stock option pool and we're amazed at how reasonable sometimes that that can go down. So it does feel like there's a little cleanup going on when some of these things get broken, because how can you invest in a company if the founders only own 20%? I mean, yeah, it's, it's broken forever. I think you have to fix it from day one. And, and oftentimes, if the first investor is smart and shrewd and says, boy, I can get Sequoia or, or some other great firm, uh, but we have to fix this a little. Maybe I got to give up something to make what I have a mm. lot more worth or to increase the probability. We see that happening often. And I think it's a smart call. It's a, it's a smart decision by, by the original in investor. And, and we've seen that a number of times. Yeah. All right, let's end uh, where the journey began. Um, I was able, lucky enough to meet Don Valentine a number of times, one of the warmest uh, generous uh, individuals you meet in the industry. Uh, obviously, he started uh, the firm and he, he didn't name it after himself, right? He named it Sequoia. He wanted it to be a legacy. You're part of that legacy. And now Ruloff and, and Alfred and, and this next generation. Maybe you could talk a little bit about Don, what made him so special. So first of all, I adored Don Valentine. But what warmest guy. would not be in the top five adjectives that I yeah. would describe him. Don mm. was shrewd, tough, mm. diabolical. And when he was angry, he just sounded like this. The voice came down and wow. he would scare the living crap out of you. He was very focused on the first order issues. He was very focused on markets. Remember, it was a different time right. uh, and so on. And to me, the greatest asset, the greatest trait is that 
One day he had a sense of history about him. He saw what happened at other venture firms where the founding fathers stood around too long, continued to take equity, drove, drove the firm into the ground. And you have the examples. I don't have to name them. And he decided right. he did not want to do that. And he turned the partnership to a whole bunch of young investors. He just told us what he didn't want to do. And we included him in a carry, even though he was not full-time involved in what turned out to be the Google Fund. And it was a great mm -hmm. example of someone doing the right thing on one side, someone on the other side doing the, the right thing, and yeah. everything working out incredibly well. And as he got older, I also remember he never spoke up unless asked. Uh, mm -hmm. he, wanted, he never offered opinions unless asked. And it was a great example of what a former leader should be. In other words, I'm about to be a former leader in the next you know, few months or years. And that's the playbook I want. I don't want to be the person that people run to where they don't like the answer for the current leader. And he was very mm -hmm. careful not to be that. So it was an evolution of a man from a tough semiconductor, 1970, you know, two by four mindset to something more, more akin to what the 90s have required. Uh, a much more generous man later on, a softer yeah. man, but it was a metamorphosis. And that to me was that's the most the man impressive I thing about Dan Valentine. Yeah. But warm, here's a little story that's in a book. Once I attended a presentation as an associate with Don, we left the presentation, Don left a note with green ink. He only wrote in green ink. He left that on a table for me to see. Doug, Dash, not fit to listen to founders. Left that on a table for me to see. That was my feedback in the way I was questioning founders. Wow. You learn real fast. You know, you have safe spaces. I want feedback every Monday afternoon. Let me know if I'm doing okay. Let me tell you, that memo, not memo, that note from Don was worth yeah. 20 of those meetings that we now have. And so right. I love the man. He gave me the shot of a lifetime. I respect him greatly. And uh, boy, he changed my life. He gave me a shot. Okay. We'll end on Michael Moritz and rule off. Uh, Michael, just a, a juggernaut as well in the industry. Maybe you could tell us uh, about his legacy and what it's yeah. like to work with him. And then finally, let's end on rule off. Well, on Michael, keep in mind, he is a, a Brit. He is mm -hmm. self-contained. Uh, he is strategic as heck. Thinks four steps ahead. You can't have a conversation with him without him asking all the questions and you providing all the answers. Three word questions, you're talking for 20 minutes. Uh, not easy going at all, but he and I made it work for 20 years. We were two mm. diametrically opposed individuals. The funny yeah. thing is, he bought a house in Italy and I love to go to London and uh, go figure. Uh, <laughs> he's taking Italian lessons and I see him at Sequoia every once in a while and I'm learning to speak English. I, 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 I used <laughs> to have a dictionary, a little black one in my desk because Mike would actually use words in a partner's meeting. I had to go look it up. Uh, and that's a true story, Classic. by the way. I'm not making it up. We made it work. I can tell you it was not easy for him who probably thought I constrained him and it wasn't mm -hmm. easy for me who I thought maybe had too many extremes on both sides. But the important right. thing, we made it work, mutual respect. And here we are at the right page in his 60s and we're still in the same partnership. And to me and for him, I bet it's a great sense of pride. Uh, yeah. And I think once we both step away from Sequoia, it's going to be fun to have a few drinks and talk about how I drove him crazy, he drove me crazy, and a hug. Yeah. You know, it's that kind of relationship. Uh, Creative tension, yeah, always it's, it's great for the business. Uh, yeah. Ruloff has really grown and mature as a leader. Uh, mm. Ruloff, uh, younger man, driven. Um, a little more emotion that he has now, but heart incredibly in the right place. Uh, he wants to do the right thing for everybody. And I would say that Ruloff is as good a leader as we've had at Sequoia, certainly better than I have been. I can tell you, I, I, I look at Ruloff and I don't hold the candle to that man. By wow. the way, I think the same thing about Mike Moritz. And the right. beauty is that we all stand on each other's shoulders. So part of it is predictable. Ruloff should be better than I because he was standing on my shoulders. Uh, right. but I could not be more pleased with what Ruloff has done in the U.S. And I would forecast that Sequoia's best year are ahead of us 
due to mm-hmm. not only Ruloff, but the team we've assembled that has many other names, many other names. Such a great, amazing uh, career you've had. And it's so engaging to be an investor, to work with all these people. When you do hang it up, when you do get off the court, are you prepared for that change of pace to not be in the room with the action? Do you think you can handle it? Do you think you can handle being out of the game and not in it? The answer is absolutely yes. Well, why not say okay. one never knows? That's the honest answer. <laughs> but I've been at it for 35 years. If truth be known, I force one more foreign cycle on myself without losing an inch. The thing I don't want to be is the guy who stuck around the fun too long, which means I'm bringing it every day. But bringing it every day means that, that you reach a point that it's gotten physically painful. I, mm. I, I told Rula just yesterday, I am so relieved. I don't have to be the person to come up with all these other great ideas. And I'm also sad because he has another great idea on how to dominate. And he and I were talking about strategic move four years from now. So there is a bit of a dichotomy in my brain, but I'll be ready. I, I, I'm going to be on eight or nine boards. Uh, I bought a whole bunch of musical instruments. I picked up golf during COVID. I stink at it. I've got four children in the Bay Area, seven grandchildren. I think that's enough. Uh, I think it's enough. At least well, as a starting point. On that, I just want to end with a thank you. Um, I was a rough around the edges entrepreneur. You guys took me in. I introduced a ton of companies to the firm. You said, hey, here's a checkbook. Why don't you go make some bets? Changed my life, obviously, with the Uber investment and many others. I said, I'm going to raise a fund. You said, here's the top 10 funds in the world. I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here. But you mentored me. And then most of all, you wouldn't remember it, but there was a side conversation at Sequoia. Every time I came there, I felt like I was coming to the cathedral where I would learn a lot. And you stopped me at some point. You asked me my plan. I said, you know, I, I hope. And you stopped me right there. I said, Jason, let me stop right there. Hope isn't a plan. Let's make a plan and let's talk about the plan. And anybody who's ever worked with me, any founder who's ever worked with me has heard me say, hope is not a plan. Let's make a plan. And on that note, I just want to thank you, Doug, for all the mentorship and support you and the firm have given me in my career. Uh, it's just been an honor and a pleasure to know you. Thank you and for to spend having this hour me. with you. Thank you for having <laughs> me. It's a true honor. Right. Thank you. Ah, thanks, Doug. All right. We'll see you all next time. Bye bye. Hey, everyone. Producer Nick here. I want to tell you about the SaaS syndicate. If you're a founder of a SaaS company with a product in market, our investment team wants to talk to you. Head over to the syndicate.com slash SaaS, S-A-A-S, to apply to raise from the SaaS syndicate. And you can join Jason's syndicate of over 9,000 accredited investors at the syndicate.com. Producer Justin here. No cool startup? Check out OpenScouting.com, where anyone can refer a startup to our investment team here at launch. Even if you don't know the founder, if you're the first to flag a company for us and we decide to invest, you'll get 5K in cash or 10% of our carry. Hey everybody, producer Rachel here. Are you an early stage startup that has product and market, some traction, and are looking to raise at least $500,000? Apply today to Remote Demo Day for your chance to pitch to over 9,000 investors in Jason's syndicate. Submit your application at remotedemoday.com. Our next event is on April 27th. And if you want to learn how to invest in startups from the world's greatest angel investor, and no, we're not talking about Chris Saka, then head to angel.university to apply. The four-hour workshop costs $300 and all proceeds are donated to charity. To date, we've donated over $175,000 to various charities, and you can see the full list at angel.university charity. 